Okay. So, uh, welcome to SN475 for the undergraduate students, uh, EC596C for the graduate students. Uh, maybe by show of hands, how many people are graduate students in the course? I think it's a relatively small number. Okay. So, as you probably can surmise, I'm Michael Adams. Some of you I've taught before, so I know I recognize some faces. Other of you, other of you I'm probably new to. Um, so I'm going to start out by giving uh, basically an overview of the course today. We're not really getting going to get into any significant material. I just want to give you a sense of what the course is about, and then that way, you know, if you go, "Oh my God, this isn't what I thought this course was," I don't want to take it. Well, at least you know. Or if you're hopefully that won't be too many people like that. Maybe some people get more excited, like, "Yeah, I'm really glad I'm taking this course." Uh, so the, this course is very interdisciplinary in nature. It has a lot of elements of both engineering, computer science, and probably some other areas as well, kind of sprinkled in. Uh, to give you some idea about some of the programming topics that might be covered, the basic idea is this course, you know, just kind of randomly grab a bunch of different topics that are kind of more advanced programming techniques and, and cover them. So the particular choices that I've made sort of relate to most of the bullet items that are listed here. Uh, I mean, I'll talk a little bit more about this maybe on the next slide because there's some overlap. Um, there's a few different application areas that are considered. I've tried to make a little bit of variety. I wanted to have some stuff on computer graphics, but I'm not going to do any this time around just because I'm still trying to resolve how I'm going to deal with this because some, some students don't have the background necessary to do some stuff related to graphics. Um, anyway, so what I, I do have is there's some stuff on computational geometry or geometry processing, some stuff on numerical analysis, some stuff on signal processing like FFT and so on. Uh, the course uses C++ as a programming language, uh, in particular the C++ 17 variant, in other words the most recent version of the language standard. Uh, we use a Linux-based uh, software development environment with both the GCC and Clang compiler tool chains. Uh, so if you're really, really violently against Linux and, and really only like Windows, and unfortunately I did have one person like that last year, this is probably not the course for you. Um, I think it's good to get a variety of uh, exposure to different operating systems and environments. Uh, but just so you're forewarned. Uh, in terms of the prerequisites and requirements to take this course, uh, you should have reasonably good programming skills. The, there is the reason why the word advanced it appears in the title of the course, advanced programming topics. Um, I would strongly recommend that you attend, be willing to attend the lectures regularly, uh, mainly because there's a lot of more advanced material. Hopefully, if, if this recording of the video is kind of hands out, this might help to reduce the importance of this a little bit, at least if you're willing to watch the online videos. But it's probably good to attend the lectures anyway, because you can't ask questions to YouTube. Well, you can try, but you're not going to get a good answer back. Um, another reason for wanting to attend the lectures, something that makes part of this material tricky is, you know, C++ has been going through a very rapid evolution over the last several years, and it's sometimes hard to find stuff that's actually correct and up to date, because some things change in ways which are sort of not, they change the semantics of the language and so on. Uh, so again, I'm using C++17, the most recent version of the standard. Some things that I say will not be true for older versions of the standard, but I don't care. This is one of the nice things about teaching. You don't have to worry about legacy. <laughs> coding started from today. No C++ code existed before today. Um, you should have a basic familiar with C familiarity with C++. As I mentioned in the email that I sent, I think after the first week of registration uh, ended, I sent the email to the people who registered at that point, just pointing out that you're assumed to know basic you know, rudimentary C++. So I'm not going to be talking about classes and templates and things like that. You should know the basics of it. Essentially, what would be covered by CSC 116. Um, that said, though, if if you have really good programming skills and maybe you can get up to speed quite quickly with a new language, it, it it might be feasible to take the course even if you don't have background. But you'll you'll have to work hard to get up to speed. Uh, I know some students have done this, um, but but you would have to have pretty strong skills because C++ is a difficult language. I would argue it's the most difficult language out there, but unfortunately, it's a very useful one to know when you're looking for jobs. A lot of the kind of high performance areas, it's C and C++ that are used. So, anyway, for what it's worth, um, what else do I want to say? Uh, we won't really be relying on any knowledge of C++ until the second week of classes, so if you want to do a crash course on C++, there's the lecture videos that I, uh, I mentioned, or I will mention later in the lecture today, that cover basically a lot of the introductory material if you want to watch that use as a reference. Um, the, just, just as a kind of a, a bellwether to give you a sense of like what where the course is going to go later, and more importantly, maybe what's expected of you at the beginning. Assignment number one, the programming assignment number one in the course, is basically a review of C++, like what I consider to be a review, giving you like a, a sense of what it is that you're expected to know coming into the course. So if when you're doing assignment one, you're going, oh my God, this is really, really hard, drop the course. 
um, because it, it's it's review. It's going downhill from there if, if that's really difficult. Um, I, and I apologize if you don't know the language, and because of that, you need to, to draw up the course. But I have, in order to do advanced programming topics, I have to draw kind of a baseline and assume you know something in some language. And C++ is the language that I'm using. So uh, for better or for worse, that's kind of the deal there. Um, anyway, so you can get a, I would recommend that you start working on assignment one as early as you can. So you can get a, if you're, if you're kind of unclear about whether you have the background that's needed, then you can get a very quick indication. In terms of the topics that are covered in the course, this is approximately the order that things are going to be covered in. So I'll start out by talking about some basics about algorithms and data structures. And, and one of the challenges of teaching this course is there's a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. So for example, people from computer science, maybe software engineering, I expect probably you have quite strong background already in data structures and algorithms. Um, from what I know from last year teaching the course, though, there is some new stuff that I cover, like I put a new spin on things. I have a very particular kind of perspective. Um, then we're going to be talking about some, uh, maybe we spend maybe one or two lectures talking about the things that people think they know about C++ but don't typically how to use cons. Um, not to say that nobody here knows how to use it, but there's always some people who think that they do, but they realize that they don't once they start talking about it. And it's really, really fundamentally important. So I'll talk about const and some other stuff related to that. Um, then we'll talk about temp some stuff related to copy lesion, types of optimizations, temporary objects, and so on. Then talk about exceptions, some stuff about computer arithmetic, and some of the things that you can run into, problems, because computer arithmetic, finite precision arithmetic, doesn't give you the exact answer. And this causes low end of grief in a lot of application areas. Um, then we'll talk about memory management, container classes, some cache efficient algorithms, talk about concurrency, smart pointers, vectorization. And I think we should be able to get through all of that material. I was able to get through it last year. Um, I say if time permits, I may add some additional topics, but I suspect time won't permit. It's, last year it played out just kind of perfect. No extra time, but didn't run over time either. In terms of what I want to try to teach in this course, when I, when I designed this course, um, there were a number of kind of very specific goals. Um, as you can sort of surmise from the title, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of emphasis on, on you know, performance, efficiency of code, and also robustness, in other words, correctness of code. So some of the things that I'd like you to be able to come away from the course knowing is having a better idea about what are some of the things that can impact the performance or correctness or robustness of code. Um, also be able to select data structures and algorithms to solve a particular problem where the data structures and algorithms are chosen in a way which will lead to a naturally efficient kind of implementation or well-performed application. Um, be able to design and implement software, well, I shouldn't really say design, there's not as much stuff uh, designing interfaces. Often the interfaces are given to you in programming assignments and then you just have to implement them. Um, but being able to read a design spec, in other words, a, a specification of how the so API for the software is supposed to be, and then you implement that. Um, and, and my experience is a lot of students have difficulty with like reading a spec and then implementing things from a spec. Uh, not, not everyone, but some students have struggle a bit with it. And it's, it's really important because when you're working on large scale projects, there will be design documents that you will need to implement things from that spec. Because if you don't, then your software won't integrate with other people's uh, software, you know, things won't even compile. So this is really important. Uh, I hope that you'll get out of the course the, the, the importance of thoroughly testing your code. Uh, the programming assignments in this course are, are there's a very heavy emphasis in marking on correctness. Uh, because at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. When you're writing code, the code needs to work with a reasonable level of efficiency and so on. You know, so like it, if it works, but it takes 10 million years to do its task, you know, it's probably not useful. But assuming that it has a reasonable level of efficiency, the, the thing that really matters is whether it's correct. Everything else is secondary. Whether the code is modular, maintainable, all this stuff is secondary for achieving the goal of making it work in the first place. So with that in mind, it shouldn't really be surprising that a lot of emphasis is placed on whether things work or not. So I have very extensive test cases that I've developed that I run all of the assignments through for, for uh, helping the TA guide them, guiding the TA in the marking. Um, by, by the end of the course, you should have, I guess, what I would call maybe an intermediate level uh, competency in C++. Maybe you could call it advanced. It's, it's kind of maybe on the borderline. There are some fairly advanced topics that we talk about. Um, and you'll get some exposure to the C++ standard library, a few other libraries as well, some parts of Boost. Yeah, I guess that's all I really want to say about this slide. Um, I have a few handouts. Um, you should have a copy of the, I guess it's the course outline, and there's one other page attached in front of it. The course outline actually starts on, I think, the, the second physical page of paper in the handout. 
Um, so there's some handouts here that I'm going to go through that you don't actually have, but they're on the course website. Maybe the most important thing on the, the course outline is at the very beginning where it lists the, uh, let me just bring it up here. Maybe the most important thing is this part here where it gives the URL for the course website. Um, pretty much everything that you need to know or need to do the course is available either from that website or through links that are on that website. Uh, so what do I want to say about the outline? So my office hours will start in the second week. There's not really any point to have office hours the first week because we haven't really covered anything. So they'll start next week. I'll circulate an email, I'll circulate a doodle poll, I should say, by email. Basically, I'll list a bunch of time slots in this doodle poll for when my office hours could potentially be, and you can all vote, and then the one that has the most votes I'll use is my office hour time slot. Um, the uh, course website, for the most part, most things are not password protected, but there is... Um, some material, typically solutions and things, which are password protected. So for every, it's not your Netlink credentials that you need to use to access the password protected area. It's the same username for everyone, just CPP. This stands for C++, it's kind of a C++ e course. And the, you, the uh, password you need to use is all lowercase letters. Well, actually, I probably shouldn't. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. It's going to be online anyway. Um, X value 108, in retrospect, it was a bad idea to put this on the slide. Anyway, <laughs> I think probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it from this and then let you know because it's a bad idea to put the password online. Anyway, I wasn't thinking too much about the recording. Again, this is a new thing. I never tried recording things before, so there's probably going to be some hiccups and embarrassments along the way, not just for, for uh, you guys potentially, but maybe more importantly for me. I can really humiliate myself by making embarrassing mistakes online. At least they can't see my face, though. So anyway, enough said about that. Um, so the tutorials are mandatory, as I pointed out and also point emphasized here. They're mandatory in the sense that lectures are mandatory. I mean, I would really strongly encourage you to attend the tutorials. Um, the reason why is they're not like a normal tutorial. They're, they're kind of used more like a lab, and there is content in the course that I cover. I, I run the tutorial myself, and there is material that I present there, which is really essential and important, and if you're not there, it could cause a great deal of difficulty for you. So this is a sense in which things are mandatory. Um, I, I'm not sure the setup's a little bit different in a lab, so I may also try to record some of the stuff I'm doing, but because of the nature of the stuff in the tutorial, it might not work out as well. So it may, may be more important to be in the tutorials, perhaps, than the lectures, arguably. Anyway, well, see, we'll see how it goes. Again, this whole video recording thing is kind of new, so I'm not quite sure how it's going to work out. Uh, the tutorials actually start this week, and the tutorials are on Wednesday, so the first tutorial is actually tomorrow. So make note of that. You'll definitely want to not miss that tutorial. Um, I think that might have been most of what I have here. Um, the required textbook is just a set of lecture slides. I say just a set of lecture slides. It's just a set of about 2,500 lecture slides, but give or take. Um, it, it's pretty comprehensive. It covers a lot of different topics, not just C++, but things like test software testing and a lot of other stuff as well. Uh, we don't cover everything in those lecture slides. Obviously, I, I can't get through in like whatever we have 30 so hours. I can't get through 2,500 lecture slides. Uh, but a lot of that stuff's review. Like a lot of it is sort of the basic kind of core language, like you know, classes, templates, some of that stuff. So it may be useful as a reference. Um, but all the material we cover also is included in the lecture slides. So you can just download them from, well, if you go to the course website, it has a link to this thing that my mouse is pointing at here, which has the... Uh, the lecture slides you can download. And may, there's various different versions, so make sure you download the most recent one, which is the one I'm using in the course. Um, I've also listed an optional textbook, which is uh, Stroh Strip's book on C++. I mean, if you want a good reference, I'd, I'd say it's probably arguably the best one that's out there. It's not the best maybe for necessarily learning the language, but it's a good reference to have uh, kicking around. Uh, maybe getting a little bit dated, because it was published in, I think it was 2013, 2014, and now we have C++ 17, which is, came out in 2017, so it's a little bit out of date, but not too badly, so. Moving along here. There's a number of other important documents on the course website. Uh, one of them that got kind of missed from this list, well, actually it kind of falls into the category of assignment handouts, but really it's quite important, is the what's called the assignment assessment handout. Um, this basically explains how the your assignment component of your mark is calculated. So make sure that you look at that. Otherwise, you could be in for some big surprises. Things are not equally weighted. Uh, there's differences depending on whether you're a graduate student or an undergraduate student in the course in terms of what the requirements are. Uh, so this is a very important handout to look at. I'll also show it to you briefly and a little bit later. 
Uh, but anyway, that kind of was an oversight until uh, just this morning. I didn't notice that. Um, in terms of your assessment for the course, uh, it's a little bit different depending on whether you're in the undergraduate version of the course, SN 475, or whether you're in the graduate version of the course. The main difference is there's a project for graduate students. Um, and because of this, the final exam is weighted a little bit less for graduate students compared to undergraduate students to compensate for the fact that they have to work on the project typically towards the end of the term more. Um, so one difference between undergraduate and graduate students is the project. The other difference is how the assignment marks are calculated. So this is not evident here. I mean, the weight is the same for both 50% and 50%, but how that mark is calculated is different for graduate versus undergraduate students. And this is explained in detail on the ass assignment assessment handout that I mentioned a moment ago, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. Um, with regard to the programming assignments, I'm very sensitive about plagiarism issues, so please make sure your work is your own. I will do everything in my power to try to make sure that plagiarism doesn't happen. Um, the assignments are to be done independently by each student. I don't mind you kind of pointing each other in the right direction. If someone gets stuck and you want to help your classmate, by all means, like kind of give them hints, but don't give them your code and don't tell them exactly what to do. Like even though it may be out of the goodness of your heart, you're trying to give them your code, you do this, then you're into plagiarism territory because then your code will look like their code. And the university policy is we don't care whose code it was originally. Both people are guilty of like plagiarism because otherwise, it, I guess probably they do that because it's hard to tell where the code came from originally. So everyone's guilty. So please make sure that you, you know, I don't want things to get very like negative kind of environment. So by all means, help your classmates, but do it by kind of giving them hints, pointing them in the right direction, but don't give them the full code or anything like that because that can lead to plagiarism issues. And both myself and also the TA marker for the course, we reserve the right to ask any student at any time questions about stuff they've submitted. So if you submit it, it's fair game to ask you any questions about it with the goal of trying to ascertain whether it's your own work or not. And from time to time, we may just randomly pick people and say, like, can you explain this and this in your assignment? Uh, so if you get called either to my office or to, to the TA's office and they're asking you questions about the assignment, don't panic. It's, it doesn't necessarily mean there's any suspicion of plagiarism. There is going to be some random sampling just from time to time. Um, of course, if there's something where we strongly suspect plagiarism, well, then, of course, we'll do the same thing. But just to make it a little bit kind of for confidentiality reasons, so there's some randomness as well, too. So just because someone gets asked doesn't necessarily mean, whoa, he's in trouble or she's in trouble. But just be aware of this. And I reserve, we reserve the right also to use tools to check for you know plagiarism as well, anti-plagiarism kind of software tools. Um, just a few things about uh, that I'm kind of obligated to say, I guess, due to BC privacy law or whatever. Um, your mar marks are maintained in a Google Docs spreadsheet. Uh, so this means that your, your marks are stored in a spreadsheet. It's, it's secure. I mean, it's password protected and stuff, obviously. Uh, but it's stored on a server outside of the university. So I'm obligated to let you know. And if you object to this, you can say, no, I don't want my marks stored off-site, and then I have to make some special arrangements for you, which I can do. Um, but just so you're aware of that, typically it seems not to be a problem. But anyway, that option is there if you're really scared about that. Um, also, we're using GitHub for assignment submission. So obviously, <laughs> your assignments are stored off, off campus. They're stored on, on GitHub's website, which is probably not, it's, well, it's not in Canada, safe to say. Uh, not sure if it's in the US, but it doesn't really matter. It's not in Canada. Uh, so there's the sort of same sort of issues here. Like you're putting stuff that's yours onto uh, you know, GitHub website. So if you really violently object to submitting your assignments through GitHub, I can make special accommodations. Um, I don't imagine it's a problem for probably all of you have GitHub accounts anyway, and you probably use GitHub, so like whatever personal information is there, like your email address, it's already there. Uh, but anyway, just so you're aware, there is options to deal with this if you have concerns. And I think this is everything for this handout I need to talk about. Yeah, the rest is just kind of standard boilerplate stuff. Probably still helpful to look at, but not really so important from my point of view. So this is the assignment assessment handout that I was referring to before. So I'll just make a few comments about the assignments in the course. So there's assignment zero. There's actually like seven assignments in the course, numbered from zero to six. Because of course you can see in C++ plus the number from zero. Uh, but no, actually there's more logic to why it's assignment zero. Assignment zero is not really an assignment. It's kind of a pseudo assignment. Like it's an assignment in the sense that you're assigned it, you have to do it, you get graded for it. Uh, but it's not really, you don't really write any code. It's just to kind of familiarize yourself with how to use some of the software tools that I'm using for the course and kind of go through the mechanics of submitting the assignment just to see how it works. Uh, just so for the assignments that are weighted much more that really matter, because you can see the weight of this is only 2%. So it doesn't really matter in terms of marks, but the idea is you want to make sure you do it because this is going to kind of teach you how you submit assignments and you don't want to 
not submit one of the other assignments that come later because you don't know how to do it. Um, and then you lose like, whatever, 19% of your mark or something for missing a later assignment. So it's 2% for assignment zero, which is kind of an introduction to the tools that we're using like Git and CMake and things like that. Um, then we have uh, each of the remaining assignments after assignment zero have three parts, part A, part B, part C. Part A is like an English answer type thing. You're not writing code, you're just answering concepts in, in hopefully coherent English. Um, all the assignments, the part A is you have to do all of them, whether you're a graduate student, undergraduate student, everyone does all the part A's for all the assignments. Um, then the assignments are also split into a part B and C, and B and C are you're actually writing code. These are like programming parts of the assignment. Now for assi the part B's, everyone has to do all the part B's. So there's six assignments with six, you know, six part B's, so you can do all these. Um, however, this list two below, I scroll up here, depending on whether you're a graduate student in the course, you're taking uh, 596C, or you're an undergraduate taking 475, the rules are different here. Um, we have basically, uh, for assignments two to six, there is no part C for assignment one, that's why there's no assignment one part C here, they didn't have a part C. Um, but for the remaining ass assignments, there's a part C, and, and basically your mark is calculated if you're an undergraduate student by taking your three best marks from these last five here. So what's sort of implied with that is that you have like two free get out of jail cards. So like, if for some reason you're unable to do two of the assignments, you don't get hurt. Um, that said, I would strongly encourage like the undergraduate students also try, like try all of these if you have time. Because your mark inevitably will be higher if you try all of them, because if you try is it five? If you try five of them, your best mark out of five will likely be better than your best mark out of three, most likely. Um, at least if you're able to put a you know, significant effort into each one. Also, it might help you in the final, too, because it might help strengthen your understanding of the material. But I would say even more importantly, from my point of view, if I was a student, it will help you to learn the material better when you go into job interviews where you're getting asked questions about material like this. And I've had students tell me from last year that they did get asked questions like this, and it helped them get jobs. It might be helpful from that point of view to do those other assignments as well. Uh, but anyway, for the undergraduate students, you only have to do three out of three out of five of these. Uh, but I would encourage you to do as many as you can because it can be beneficial. Graduate students, sorry, you do them all. Uh, you're, typically, your course load is much lower, so and you have a lot more free time on your hands. Uh, plus, there has to be something to kind of distinguish the graduate and undergraduate version of the course. Anyway, so that's the deal there. Again, this assignment, this is really, really important here. These ones are all kind of put into a bin, like the list one, list two are kind of all put into a bin and they're equally weighted, the ones that we do. Um, but there's the kind of the weirdness of some of them, if you're an undergraduate student, you may not need to do because you only have to do three out of five. Does that make sense? You can go back and look at it as well if, if, if you need to reference it later. Um, next thing is the assignment handout. Um, the assignment handout is actually split into a number of different documents. There's like a general information section, which you should read before you do any of the assignments, and then there's a kind of separate handout for assignment zero, one, two, three, four. They're actually all part of the same PDF, but for convenience, I split them into separate PDFs when I put them on the course website. But this is just the very beginning, just to give you an idea of what the document looks like. Um, assignment zero, which is you kind of a, an assignment that's showing you how to use the tools in the lab, like how to use Git, how to use CMake, and a few other things as well, how to use LCOV, it's a code coverage tool. Um, these things are all in assignment zero. So, and these due dates are also on the course website as well. I put all the course, pretty much everything for the course is on the course website, due dates for everything. But anyway, just so you're aware of it, these are there. Assignment one is due on May 24th. And assignment one is basically a kind of review of C++. So you might want to make note of that. Again, it's also on the course website. Uh, the next handout, if you're an undergraduate student in the course, you can kind of go to sleep because this doesn't apply to you. You don't have to do the project. Uh, please don't do it. You're just going to do like a lot of work for no marks. Uh, but if you're a graduate student in the course, uh, basically there's a project that you need to do. Uh, the project is done individually, so not in groups. Um, basically, you need to do something with C++. You have to use the programming language C++ since this is what we're using. Uh, but there's a lot of latitude in terms of what you can choose for the project. I'd recommend maybe you talk to your supervisor and try to do something that maybe it might be helpful for whatever research project you're working on. And there's sort of two components for marking for the project. There's a proposal, which is submitted about, I think, about end, end of June approximately, uh, which is saying in writing, this is what I promised to do. And then I can give a stamp of approval or not at that point. And then later on, much later on, near the end of term, typically sometime in the final exam period, you submit the actual software you developed. Uh, so that's the, the basic format here. 
skip over a lot of those other. Again, please read these, read this in detail if you are a graduate student, because you need to know this stuff, but I don't want to go through the whole thing. Um, in order to do the proposal, though, you need to spend a fair amount of time doing a preliminary investigation. Like basically, it's like a feasibility study. You say, I'm going to do this, and this is what I'm describing, and I'm also checked to make sure I can actually do it. Because whether it's, it's actually very easy to to propose something that's completely infeasible. Uh, ironically, I've never had any under any graduate student propose a project that was too easy. Never, not even close. I had a lot of students propose something. I look at it and say, "You're never going to get that done. Not in the time frame of this course." Uh, so the, the proposal kind of gives me a way to check, but still, you have to do due diligence because it's very difficult for me to predict. You know, because what's possible for one person might not be possible for another. It depends on programming skills and so on. So I can just do my best. But some cases, it's just, it's so far off. Like, even if you're Einstein for programming, you couldn't do it. Like, it's just not possible. So those things I can beat out. Um, anyway, but because you have to do kind of a feasibility study, you need to, can't leave it to the last minute because you need to spend time to invest to make sure, like, what libraries I'm going to use. Is, is the stuff available that I need to do the project and so on. And I think that's everything I need to say here. Yeah. Okay, so now the undergraduate students should wake up again. Um, uh, there's uh, some video lectures that I have online. These are mainly stuff which is uh, you know kind of background material on C++. The only stuff from the point of view of this course that sort of I'm requiring you to be to look at because the other stuff is prerequisite that you already know anyway. Uh, the stuff that I'm assuming might not might be new to use, maybe you haven't used Git before, although I suspect probably the vast majority of you use Git and probably GitHub as well. How, how many people have used Git? GitHub? Okay, yeah, it's pretty much the majority. On the other hand, CMake, though, I suspect is probably new to a lot of you. I know some people use Make, but maybe not CMake. CMake is much better than Make, well, in my opinion, anyway. Much more flexible. They're, they're different things. CMake, the name is one letter difference, but they're, they don't do the same thing. One is like a meta build tool, one's a build tool. Uh, so it's not the same thing. Anyway, CMake is kind of the, well, I would argue, sort of the industry standard for this sort of stuff. Like if you're building certain types of code, this is what you would use. Anyway, so um, to whatever extent you lack the background, so if you've never used version control tools before, like Git or anything, um, the, the videos that are listed under the version control system part, you want to watch them. Um, if you're not familiar with CMake, then watch the stuff under build tools. You can skip the stuff on Make. I don't use Make at all. It's, it's just there for legacy reasons. When I, I used to use Make a long time ago in some other courses that I taught. Um, anyway, so basically, if you're don't, not familiar with build tools at all, like why you might use them, you probably want to watch this video. It's only three minutes long, not very long. And then watch the stuff on CMake. Maybe the examples and demonstrations are the most helpful thing for a lot of people, but anyway. Um, and I would recommend, if, you, if possible, do this before the tutorial tomorrow, if you can. If you can, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but if you can, it will maybe help when I'm doing a demo. It might help you to understand a little bit better what's going on. Um, but definitely before the second to, second week sometime, you want to look at those videos because otherwise you might have a lot of difficulty, particularly for CMake, since a lot of you might not be. How many people have you CMake before? A few people, okay. But it's a lot less than that. That's sort of what I expected. Anyway, uh, CMake is a very useful tool and used by a lot of projects. So, um, what else do I want to say? Oh, yeah. The, 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 from unit two on, this is kind of basics of C++. So if you're trying to do a crash course on C++, is you really want to take the course, but you don't have background knowledge about the language, there's a bunch of videos there that can give you the, the background knowledge you need. Uh, the only exception here is there's, there's one unit here which is actually material covered in the course. Uh, concurrency, this stuff in, in section six, at least part of it will be covered in the course. So that is not expected that you know this. And section seven, you can forget about because I don't think we're using, well, at least, well, you don't need to watch any of the videos. Any stuff we need to know about Seagal, I'll, I'll talk, talk outside of the context of the videos. Uh, so basically, the only thing you're sort of really responsible for at the beginning of the course, make sure you know Git, which the vast majority of it looks like you're in good shape, and also make sure you know CMake, uh, and, the, and then you should be okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Oh, I should probably comment on these other things. So there's also some other handouts that I want to mention here. There's a handout which has all the non program exercises. I mentioned the part A for all the assignments are like English answers, like you're asking sort of ask conceptual programming questions and then you need to answer them. Um, the actual problems are on this handout. The, the actual assignment just says like problem 8.1 or something and then you have to go to this other handout to actually find what the problem statement is. Um, this thing is actually the front page of the hard copy handout that you have today. Um, this is just begging and pleading that if as you go through the course you go, hey, these lecture slides I'm using, they're really good. 
uh, please review, post reviews of them on either Google Books or Google Play Books. Um, it won't change your mark at all. I don't typically look at the reviews, at least I deliberately avoid looking at them when I'm teaching. I won't look at them until after I'm done. So even, I couldn't be persuaded anyway, but even if some kind of deeper underlying psychology is at work, I don't know. I won't look at it until I'm done teaching, so I can't influence your mark in any way. Um, but it's very helpful to me because I've gone the route of, like, all, all my course materials for people with high courses taught by me, I, I've gone the route of open access, so I don't publish with traditional publishers because then you have to pay obnoxious amounts of money. But the downside is I have to defend to the university that my time spent on these things is worthwhile. Uh, so it's really helpful if you post reviews, particularly if, they, if they're, you know, if you're really think that they are useful learning resources, because then I can go to the university and say, students are finding this helpful. And then when they say, yeah, right, like show me the show me the money, show me the evidence. Then I can say, well, look at the reviews that they posted here. So it's really very helpful. Uh, but I'll come back to this more at the end of the term, because obviously you haven't looked at the lecture slides. I could be just BSing you. It could be a pile of crap, you know, 2,500 files, 200,000 200, slides are just garbage. Um, anyway, but it's not. I, I've had quite good feedback about it. And then the last thing here, I'm not going to actually look at it in specific detail, but I just want you to be aware of it. There's what's called the Course Materials Bug Bounty Program. So that the basic idea here is that if you find any mistakes on pretty much any of the materials for the course, at least types that ones in with maybe excluding my emails, but, but things like you know any of the handouts that are listed here, the lecture slides, if you find errors, whether they're typos or technical errors, whatever, if you report them to me by email, um, and, and basically read this handout, it's kind of the fine details of what you know, what the rules of the game are, how, the, how your bonus mark is calculated, but the idea is you can get bonus marks for reporting bugs. And this allows me to, to uh, you know, kind of encourage people to find mistakes, because often otherwise maybe a student finds a mistake but doesn't report it, and then, you know, then I can't have the slides kind of be the very best quality they can be. So I appreciate your feedback to, to help to improve them. I mean, other things, if you see anything else that you think that I could do to improve the slides, I mean, you're welcome to say, but if you find an outright error, you know, let me know and you can get some credit for the, the errors. Uh, video lectures, I guess this is kind of covered by the video lecture handout, so I probably don't really need to say too much about it. Um, if I do, if this does work out with the recording of the, the you know, desk, desktop capture for the video lectures, uh, basically where I'm gonna be putting these videos is on my YouTube channel, basically the place where all of these other C++ videos are and so on. Uh, hence my reason for having to change the password now, because in retrospect, it was probably a bad idea to put it onto the, but anyway, sorry. I'm a little bit sidetracked here. Okay, so I guess that's all I really need to say about that slide. Uh, the tutorial. So I, I kind of alluded to some of this a little bit earlier. So the tutorial, although it's a tutorial, it's not really a tutorial. It's kind of more like a lab, but also it's not really like a lab either. The department can't really quite figure out what it is. So you'll notice that the sections are like B sections, like B01, B02, which would be indicating lab. But the calendar says it's not a lab. There's no lab in this course. It's a tutorial. Um, but we're not really quite sure what it is. It's just this other thing. Uh, so what is this other thing? Um, well, it's, it's run by me, so I'm, I'm there. Uh, and it's used for a number of different purposes. It's actually scheduled in the computer lab, so we have access to a full C++ uh, development environment in the lab. It makes it a little bit easier if you want to ask questions sometimes, if you have the, com the computer there. Um, of course, you know, it's not a big deal often. You might have a laptop you can bring along, but just in case you don't, on that particular day, it's helpful to have a lab that we can use. Um, there's a number of different purposes that I use this tutorial for. It varies depending on the particular you know, needs of the student at the time that I'm teaching the course, which varies from offering to offering. But some of the things I've used the tutorial for are things like uh, um, having kind of an office hours where I'm either in the lab or I'm promising to be in my office at the time of the tutorial. So if you run into any problems, you know for sure that you can find me. So it's, it's like an office hours time where if you, if you need be, you can actually have me sit down in front of the computer that you're using in the lab and, and get help that way. So that's one possibility. Um, another, which I've used quite a bit, is to sometimes give presentations on topics which are, which are things that students are having difficulty with. Maybe I get an, a marked assignment back, and before I give it back, I take a quick look at it and go, oh, wow, a lot of people did this wrong. And, and then I can come, just so that maybe they don't keep making the same mistake on sub subsequent assignments, I may reserve some time in the tutorial to talk about that and try to explain and give some examples to show like why something is wrong and what the issues are and so on. Uh, or maybe you might give some demos uh, for various different tools. This is what I'm going to be doing pre predominantly in the tutorial this week is I'm going to demo. Well, I'll show you some stuff using like Git, which is probably not interesting to most of you because you've used Git before, but still some people might not have used Git. I don't think quite everyone's hand is up. Um, but more importantly, I'm going to be going through CMake, 
and maybe show you a few other tools as well, something called you complete me, which is a, like a, a semantic code completion tool for, for VI. If you happen to use the VI editor, it's available in our software development environment. Also, I'm going to be talking about a code coverage tool called LCOV, which I, I'm going to encourage you to use. Code coverage tools are really good when you're trying to figure out, you know, how good are the test cases I have for testing my assignments. Um, so those are some things that I, I might use in terms of uh, software demonstrations. Um, also, too, the time in the tutorial. In this sense, the tutorial is kind of mandatory because if you're not there, like if you're one of the people that gets selected, it's essentially these kind of randomized uh, interviews with respect to the assignments to test to see whether or not it, it looks like you actually did the work yourself and so on. Most likely the time that you would be asked to, to meet, the well, it's probably most likely going to be the TA, not me, the marker, because the marker kind of knows more directly what you actually did or didn't do in the assignment. Um, most likely that will happen during the tutorial because it's one of the few times we know everyone should in principle be there. Um, anyway, so in this sense, it's probably a very good idea to be at the tutorial, especially at, this, at the beginning when in case the TA wants to talk to you um, or me. And uh, this last thing I think is kind of, maybe kind of cool is, I mean, you can work on the assignments, whatever. You don't really need to have a tutorial set aside for that. But anyway, if, in, if, in the absence of anything else, you can work in the, in the lab there on the assignment if you want. So as I mentioned, the tutorials start in the first week of classes. Um, they may not necessarily run for the full duration of the class schedule. I mean, last year when I taught the course, they, they went for most of the most of the class schedule, but not right to the very end. Uh, so pro probably for most of the term, but not the entire term. And as I mentioned before, the tutorial attendance is mandatory because um, there may be some really important stuff that I cover from time to time in the tutorials. Uh, I know some people have a conflict with e an econ course. Um, I'll try to kind of front load the more important stuff at the beginning of the tutorial because the conflict typically that people are have reported to me is towards the end, the last 20 minutes. Um, if I can record some of the video and like do desktop capture in the tutorial, which I'm not sure if this is going to be feasible because of the type of stuff I need to present. Uh, but if I can do that, then it becomes less of an issue, except for the maybe meeting with the TA or myself to be, be a question about programming assignments and so on. Uh, plagiarism, yeah, I have a whole slide de de devoted to this just because I want to make sure and make really clear, like, don't do this because it's taken very seriously by the university and in particular by me, it's taken very seriously because, you know, this is, of course, is a hard course and the people who, you know, by and large, most students are, are, are very honest people and those people who go through and slave through and get a good mark and then someone else come along, doesn't do anything, just copy stuff, you know, they don't deserve to get a good mark. Uh, so, like, I take this very seriously because it's, you know, it's an issue of fairness to students. Um, so, just, you know, just some examples of plagiarism, you know, taking code from another source without clearly acknowledging the source. For the assignments that you're doing, there's no need to take code from anywhere because you're basically doing things from the ground up. Uh, uh, helping another student to commit plagiarism, like, in other words, if you give your code to other student, then you're unfortunately also in trouble as far as the university is concerned. So, like, don't give your code to other people. Point them in the right direction, but don't actually give them the solution. That's the best way to help them. Uh, posting your solutions to any public forum either while you're taking the course or after you've taken the course, because obviously if you do this, this is encouraging plagiarism, like please copy my solution, so don't do this. Um, and all plagiarism cases will be reported to the department chair. There's no, the, this is the warning. There is no warning subsequently. Um, I'm happy to say so far things have gone pretty good in terms of plagiarism. Last year I didn't have any any incidents, but, but I just want to be clear. Maybe it's, I took a lot of time to be clear up front. Don't do this because you will get in trouble if you do. Um, if you do commit plagiarism, it's automatic zero grade on the assignment in question. Again, instructors and teaching assistants can ask you questions at any time about submitted work to try to ascertain whether it's your own work. Uh, we reserve the right to use plagiarism detection tools. And again, I, I don't want to create like a very hostile environment. So like this last one here is important. Like I'm not saying don't help classmates, but don't help them by giving them the full answer. Like help them by pointing them in the right direction. They'll learn more that way and also it avoids this whole issue about plagiarism. And I guess that's that's the main part of what I wanted to say today. But since I've done a little bit early, I'll actually do a little bit, talk a little bit more about some of the subsequent slides here. Are there any questions to begin with? Yeah? Do you have a sense of how many of the waitlisted students are going to be Um I, I apologize. I didn't look at, at the situation this morning. I, I don't I think it was about a week ago when I last looked. But I think when I last looked, there were maybe about 30, something like that, 30 waitlisted might have even been more than that. There are quite a few waitlisted students. Um, 
my experience last year is that a few, quite a few people dropped the course because I think what happened was they, they thought, well, I have good enough C++ background or I'm not really sure, I'll try for a while, and then they went, no, I, I don't have enough background. So if last year was any indication, a fair number of people dropped, um, but, I, but that was also the first time the course was offered. So now there's kind of a bit more idea, probably some of you are taking the course, talk to other people who took it last year, so maybe you have a bit of an idea about what it is. So it, it, this year, maybe it might not be as many. It's really hard to say, uh, but at least there's some hope. I would say stay registered, maybe keep attending for a while. Um, and if you do reach the point, you know, if any of you reach the point where you realize, no, this course is not for me for whatever reason, I really appreciate if you could drop as soon as you can, because if you kind of linger, then other students will get blocked out, because by the time they can register, they would be so far behind that there's no hope for them. Mm -hmm. On the same issue, um, it seems there's about 60 seats in this class, and there's only 40 spots available on Sen 475. So did you have 20 points allocated for the ECE uh, course? There, so there, there's, I think the combined number of students who are allowed in the course is 45. This is a limitation of the lab that we use. There's space oh, for 45 okay. students. Okay. And because I run the tutorial, it's not feasible to have many uh, multiple uh, tutorial time slots. So that's the main reason that the, in terms of the breakdown for registration, there, there's, because there were more EC people registered last year, like quite a, well, I shouldn't say EC, but like software, like non-computer science, but like electrical engineering, computer engineering, software engineering, biomedical engineering, kind of broadly called classifying them EC. There are more students registered from those programs, so because of that, when they set up the registration, they put more slots available, like more seats available to those people. So there's more people waitlisted from computer science. Uh, but that's not any implicit bias that I wasn't involved in that. It's not implicit bias against computer science. It's just that, I guess, historically, they look at how many people took it last year from the different disciplines, and then they sort of divvy up things in proportion based on that. Um, anyway, that, does that answer your question, sort of? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go back to this. So I put a lot of effort into setting up sort of a custom software development environment. I, I basically build myself the, the Clang and GCC compiler tool chains and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Um, GCC 9.1, if any of you are like using GCC, I mean, it was just released last week. Um, I built it, but I don't, I'm not going to actually use it for the course right now because the problem is one of the code, co the code coverage tool that I want to use called LCOV, it doesn't yet support GCC 9.1. So though, and part of me would really like to use 9.1 and I'm really keen about using the latest version of tools. I'm not going to, at least until LCOV is fixed, because there's like, it's on in GitHub, I noticed there's some issues that people have posted saying, hey, it doesn't work with 9.1. Um, until it's fixed, I'm going to leave things at, with the last version of GCC before 9.1. But anyway, I put a lot of effort into the, the development environment to make sure that you're using kind of the most recent version of tools and so on within certain constraints that I have. And basically, I just what I want to show you is sort of the basic idea. I should probably open a new window here. I'm not, I'm not actually logged into the lab here. I'm using a, I'm actually, I, I can't, well, maybe I should make a few other comments as well. So the software development environment, you can use it on the lab machines, and that's kind of 100% guaranteed I support that. If anything doesn't work, I'll fix it, obviously, because I have to. Uh, but I've also built some v VM images as well, VM disk images. So if you if you use things like uh, VirtualBox or you know the various different virtualization tools, you know, don't own boxes, stuff like that under Linux, or whatever, or VMware, I guess, is another one. Um, you can use these VM images, and basically what it gives you is the same development environment that I've built, um, except for um, something that I'll talk about, I guess, in the tutorial this afternoon. There, there's there's a one software package which which knows about the different assignments in the course. That's not there. So you can basically do all of your work, for example, in the virtual machine, but there's a step where you need to kind of validate your assignment and make sure it's okay for submission. That part can't be done on the virtual machine. Um, it's not like a technical reason. I could put that software there, but the problem is it'll get out of date because it takes a lot of time to build a virtual machine disk image. Like it takes a day. And often throughout the term, I make a, tweaks and adjustments to things about the assignment definitions, like the, the assignment portion of the, of the software development environment. And I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to keep it in sync, the VVM disk images. So for that reason, I just don't include that software. But you can pretty much do everything else. And I think this might be useful to a number of people. Um, I appreciate your feedback very much. If you do use the virtual machine disk images, if you find them to be helpful, let me know. Because if everyone says, if no one says anything, then maybe I just won't bother with it next year. But I, I thought maybe it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. 
um, this project has a new library design and try to have UI components, or is it, will we be able to just SSH into the library? You, you can, well, you can even, you can tunnel back stuff. So technically, I guess you could, but, but anyway, it doesn't matter because there is no graphical interface for any of the stuff that you're doing. Um, I didn't really want to go there because once that opens up a whole other can of worms, like some people just won't have the background to be able to do some of that stuff. So, um, yeah. But in theory, if I'm comfortable with that and Oh, yeah, yeah. Everything you can do. So this is why that I don't know to what extent the virtual machines will be, the virtual machine disk images will be helpful because like in the past, I just remotely log in. But a few students last year said, well, it might be very helpful to have either Docker images or virtual machine images. I opted to go for a virtual machine because it, it's it kind of there's less that can go wrong because like everything's there. It's, you could otherwise you could run into issues if you're you know I've got to build things for Linux because that's what I use and then if you're trying to use a Docker image under Windows maybe things might not work quite right. Anyway, so I went with the option of using a virtual machine disk images. Anyway, so maybe it's useless, but at least you're aware. If I've told you it's there. If if it's a helpful thing to you, by all means use it. Um, if you do use it though, let me know if it's helpful. Or if you use it and it's not helpful, let me know because I, I want to have a better idea whether it, it's even worthwhile to build these images because it take a lot of pain and suffering to to, to do this because it takes so long to build and it ties up my machine. If I use my machine for anything else, it's just it's useless because I can't do anything. It's so slow. Anyway, um, but what I'll do is just kind of show you the basic idea. Like if you you know, for example, if I was remotely logged into the I'm not going to remote log in because then other things might go wrong because of wireless. But I have basically the same setup on this particular machine here. Uh, the only difference is the directory in which the there's basically a script that you run and when you run it it will provide you with the environment all set up so that you get the right versions of the compiler and so on like for example the the c or maybe i'll use clang like the clang c plus plus compiler is uh clang plus plus that's the name of the command if i if i type this it will just say command not found because it's not actually installed like natively on the on the machine but if i instead if i run the uh let me see it's in this directory Actually, I think I might have used the same. Let me try this. Oh, yeah, okay. I did actually name it the same as in the lab. I just played some games with Simlink. So, like, if you type literally this command in the lab, um, basically what this is, it just sets up, a, it runs a subshell, this command, and the subshell will have the environment set up so that you'll be accessing all of the tools for the course that I've set up. So, if I, for example, now try to, to run Clang, tell asking it what the version is. I guess I can just try running it all. Oops, if I could only read. I should be wearing my glasses. I can't read what this says. Oh, no, that's not Clang. Sorry. <laughs> it's all a blur. My eyes are getting really bad, and I'm too lazy to put my glasses on. OK, well, first of all, I found the command before I couldn't even find it, because the, the only version of Clang that's installed on this is the one that I've needed to install. On the lab machines, though, it, I think it, it might actually have Clang installed. So you need to be careful. If you don't use this environment, you might be using a, a really old, obsolete version of the compiler. Um, the version of GCC that's available through this is 8.3.0, uh, or 1, which is like the, the most recent version prior to the release from last week. On the lab machines, to put this in perspective, it's running 4 point something. It's like maybe a five-year-old version of the compiler, which is unacceptable for C++ because the language has, has changed so much since that compiler was uh, made available. Anyway, so the basic idea is if you want to do anything in the course, you can, like, for example, remote log into one of the machines in the, in the lab, and the information on the, the host names is listed on the course website. And if you want to log in, it's like utls.ca. Uh, and then the first thing you want to do is you want to run this SD shell. And then once you do that, within that shell, you can do all the stuff that you need to do for the course. Um, if you don't do it here, then things will not work properly. And I guess I better stop here. Any last questions?